Hello. Our discussion today is on West African Senior School Certificate of Examination, Physics. And we'll be discussing how to make an A in physics exams. Actually, I'll be talking about your WAEC, your NECO, and your GCE examination. Talking about your WAEC physics, your exam has three parts. You have the theory, the objective, and the practical. The first one you normally take is your practical exams. And your practical exam has three questions. And you answer two out of those three. And the time normally allocated to these three questions is two hours. Two hours, 15 minutes. How would you answer two questions within two hours, 15 minutes? That's two and quarter hours. Now your practical is 50 marks. And the next one you take is your objective question. Your objective, which is 50 marks. And your theory, which is 60 marks. Now, these two will be taken on the same day. Your objective and your theory. But your practical will be taken on a separate day. Now, you need to perform very well in your practical, your objective, and your theory exams to make an A. Take note that gaining admission right now, you have to make A's in your core subjects. You need A1 in order to have an upper edge. Now, considering this, Practical is 50 marks, objective 50 marks, theory is 60 marks. Now your practical, there will be three questions and you have to answer two. Now each of those three questions are graded in the following manner. What's your WIAC physics practical examination? There will be three questions and you have to answer any two. Each of those two questions will be graded under the following subject. You have your observation. Graph, slope, intercept, evaluation, accuracy, precautions, and B1 and B2. There are two questions that are usually at the bottom of each of those three questions. So each of them will be graded under the following, under these subheading. So you have to pick either one and two, or one and three, or two and three, whichever one you pick, you will be graded under the following subheading. Let me pick um, your work 2019 as a sample. Work 2019. We use that as a sample to discuss each of these headings under which your practical exam will be marked. So I've got one of your first questions, and this is 2019. 2019. You can see. So um. This is the question number one, and it ends there. I want to take question number two as an example. Now look at this. You will be given an experimental setup. Whichever one your question comes with, it could be an electric circuit, but here they are discussing optics here. Okay, so you are provided with a converging lens, holder, screen, ray box, contain an illuminated object, pin, and metal. Now these are the instructions you have to follow. Place the lens in its holder such that it is facing a distant object seen through a well-lit laboratory window. So that is how you set this apparatus. You place the lens on this lens holder. Then move the screen to and fro until a sharp image of the distant object is formed on it. Measure the distance f naught between the screen and the lens. Now this is the beginning of your observation. The first thing you take is this measurement. Now let me start taking my measurement on this board here. Don't forget, you be graded on these headings. Let me start. So I want to work with this space. I've transferred the subheadings under which your exam to be graded to this side. Do I abbreviated it? Is your observation, your graph, slope, intercept, 
evaluation, accuracy, precautions, and the two questions you will be answering at the end. Now, starting with your observation. You know, I said I'll be using WEC 2019 as a sample. And when I started looking at this question, you know, we are reading the, the um, procedure given to us. And the first thing the question said is to measure, the first measurement, measure the distance F naught, F naught between the screen and the lens. So you have to measure the distance between this screen and this is your lens. What is this distance? The first one is F naught. Now, let's assume you place your meter rule here. You know, this is just the diagram. You'll be given the apparatus in your laboratory. So if you place your ruler here and you measure the distance and your ruler shows you a distance of, um, let's assume, 25 centimeters. Okay? 25 centimeters. If you want to write it, you know, they said you should measure the distance F subscript 0, F naught. So you write it as um, F naught is equals to 25.0 centimeters. Measurements taken with your meter rule must be written to at least, at least one decimal place. If you have written it as 25 centimeters, it will be wrong. Why? Because your meter rule is calibrated in centimeters. Also, you also have the smaller division, which represents millimeter, or you call the decimal values, decimal fractions of your centimeter. So your value might not have been exactly 25. It could be 25.1 or 25.0. So you have to put it to one decimal place. That's when your value, your reading will be considered correct. If you are written F not equals 25 centimeters that would be wrong so let's continue the procedure now we are still discussing observation that's the first thing okay then it says clamp the meter will securely to the table place the illuminated object pin at the end r of the meter angle. place the lens at the position P, little objects are length, length at position P, such that X is equal to ROP, which is called 20 centimeters. Move the screen to a position Q to receive a sharp image of the object. Measure the distance Y equals to PQ. Evaluate Z equals to X plus Y. Repeat the procedure for five other values of x, which is 25 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 35 centimeters, 40 centimeters, and 45 centimeters. In each case, record x, y, and z. Step eight. Step seven. Tabulate the result. This is when you tabulate. That is the. That is the observation. That's the observation here. Tabulate the result. The next one, plot a graph with Z on the vertical axis and X on the horizontal axis. That is your graph. Plot a graph with Z on the vertical axis and X on the horizontal axis. Draw a smooth curve through the points. That is your slope. Determine from your graph the minimum value Z equals to Z naught, Z naught and its corresponding distance X naught. That is your intercept. Evaluate W equals to half open bracket Z naught over 4 plus Z naught over 2. What is that? That is your evaluation. So, from your values, you'll be graded, and whatever you get from your evaluation will be used to determine your accuracy. That you wouldn't know, but it should be done while grading your work. What about the precaution? Stage two. Stage two precautions taken to ensure accurate results. That's your precaution. Then B1, draw a ray diagram to show how a convex lens forms an image of magnification less than one. That's your question B1. And the last one, name two pairs of 
features in the human eye and a lens camera that perform similar function. Name two pairs of features in the human eye and a lens camera that perform similar functions. That is the last question B2. So all of this will be graded to a total of 25 marks. But take note that ob observation normally takes the most marks because that's where you'll be doing most of the work. Let's start with the observation in this experiment. You, are, you take your observation from the values given to you. So you take your observation from the instruction given to you. After clamping, place the limited objects at end R of the meter rule, place the length vibration P such that S equals to R P equals 20 centimeters. Move the screen to the position Q to receive a sharp image of the object. Measure the distance Y equals to PQ. The value Z equals X plus Y. Repeat the procedure for five other values of X. You see your X, the first X you are using, the first X you are using is 20 centimeters. Now you are using other values of X which is 25, 30, 35, 40 and 45. So all the X you'll be using will be 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 and 45. Now in each case record X, Y and evaluate Z. So now this is how your observation comes. You have X, the unit of X is centimeter because the values you are given are 20 centimeters, 25, 30, 35, 40, and 45 centimeters. So you have your x centimeters. You also have your y in centimeters. Then you have your z in centimeters. These are your observation comes. You know your x was taken with your meter rule. And measurement taken with the meter rule must be written to at least one decimal place. So now let's assume, okay, so the values you are giving were 20, 25, 30. So you write 20, 25.0, This is how you tabulate. You must not write it as um, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45 because you are using a meter rule and the way your meter rule is cal calibrated the minimum measurements you, could, you can take is 0 0.5 millimeter that's the minimum measurement you can take with your meter rule so you have no reason to record your distance as 20 centimeters so you have to record it to at least one decimal place. You can even make it two decimal place. It's still correct. If you make it three decimal place, you won't be penalized. But if you have written it, if you have written this as two decimal place, then here you write one decimal place, you continue, you'll be penalized for having insignificant significant figures, for having um, inconsistent significant figures or inconsistent decimal places. Here, this is one decimal place, this is two decimal place. So you will lose, I think it could be half mark, it could be a mark. So depending on their marking guard. So it must be consistent. If you even put it to three decimal place, zero, 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 you won't be penalized. But you'll be penalized for having it to zero decimal place. Now your Y, whatever your, the values of your Y are, you also record this to at least one decimal place. Let's assume we have um, um, 76.0. You write as 76.00 or 76.000. You, know, you have to write decimal place. Um, we have 65.0. Then you write 50. 
Now, your values must be in plan. It means your values must keep reducing. Now look at this, they are reducing, they are reducing. This one increased and it kept on reducing. That means there is an error in your experiment. You've made a mistake somewhere. Your values must be in plan. If you have something like this, you are losing a mark. So you have to ensure when you have something like this, then return to this step. Take your measurement of x equals to 40 centimeters and repeat the value of measuring the corresponding value of y. You will realize that you won't get this high value. You get something around 30 something. Whatever value you get, you write it down. Don't doctor your value. Make sure you perform the practical and ensure you are very fast. Because the truth is that the time given to you might not be enough if you are not very fast with it. So, your values of Z. Now, in the experiment, you are told that evaluate Z. What is Z? Z equals to X plus Y. Z equals X plus Y. So when you add, when you add your X plus Y, 20 plus 76, you have 96.000 values evaluated should be written to at least two decimal places. If you write it to three, it's correct. So usually, if you're on the safe side, I would recommend you write all the values on the table in three decimal places. Don't be penalized for doing so. If you have written this as 96, and you proceed, you add this to you write this as 90, you keep on adding 83.7, you will be penalized. You must have it to at least two decimal places. So I would recommend you write everything to three decimal places. All the values on your table, you write everything to three decimal places. You won't be so these ones are already in three decimal places. You won't be penalized for doing so. So that is one secret to getting all the marks in your observation. The next one is your graph. Okay, I used that same 2019 question two to discuss the observation. Now if you look at the graph of their table, this is their table. This is how they tabulated their results on the first question. Now if you look at the graph they plotted, this is their graph for question two. It's not a straight, straight it's not a straight line graph. You see the slope is not straight. It's curved. So we can't use this to explain how to get the slope. So let me pick their question number three. This is their third question, question three. You have this electric circuit and this is the procedure. This is their procedure. Let's just go straight to their plot a graph with R on the vertical axis and the reciprocal of V on the horizontal axis. Starting both axes from the origin 0, 0. R against V. Let's just go straight to their table of values. This is their table. You are plotting a graph of R against V. This is their R. You see, you see this this is from the first question. You know you don't tabulate your values like this. You must take it to at least one decimal place. So your R will be 2.0, 5.0, 10.0, 12.0, 15.0, and 20.0. That is how you tabulate when you get to your example, okay? Don't just lift what they did in the first question. Now let's go to their graph. So, on the vertical axis, you write your R. On the horizontal axis, you write your V raised to the power of minus 1. So, this should be V raised to the power of minus 1. Now, you have points on the graph. These are the points they have. Now, how do you draw your line of best fit while plotting your graph? That's what I want to discuss. How you get this line, the line of best fit. Because that's part of the things that will be considered while marking your graph. 
how to draw your line of best fit. Now you know the graph I just showed, I've just shown you, it talks about a graph of r against g to power minus 1. So here you write r and write your unit of your r. Oh, and here you write g to power minus 1. And what's the unit? Per volt. That's volt g to power minus 1. That's still the unit of your g to power minus 1. So this is how you start. That's how you get your full mark for your graph. Now you start um, tracing your point. You start tracing your point. Now there's something about the line of best fit. If after drawing your line, you have your points like this, this is still this is a good line of best fit. You know you have one, two, three points on the left, one, two, three points on the right. This is good. It's not every time that your line would always fall on the point. This is a good line of best fit. This is also this is also good. You see this point falling in, falling in, falling in. This one is falling out. This is falling out. This is also falling out. This two to the left, this to the right. This is also a good line of best fit. You know, you have to look, look closely to see that this point is falling to the right and these two are falling to the left. Let me zoom in so you can see. You know, when you are plotting your graph, you have to look carefully. Now you can see those points on the bottom. The last one is falling out. Also, the two second to the last ones are falling out. So when you are plotting your graph, you have to look closely. You have to look carefully. Okay, let me draw another one. Let the wrong ones come in. Let's assume you have your points like this. And you draw your line of best fit like this. This is very wrong. You have two, three points to the top, three points to the bottom. This is very, very wrong. You don't draw your line of best fit like this, in a situation like this. You know, you have three points falling to the left, three points falling to the right. You don't, the three points that are falling out must not be concentrated at one end. This is not a good line of best fit. In a situation like this, you could draw your line of best fit like this. Um, let me see. I think this will be good enough. No, no, no. It's not even good. Okay, it's still okay. It's still okay. One, two, three on the right. One, two, three on the left. You see, the points that are falling to the right are not just concentrated at one end. So this will be a good line of best fit. Take notes. You must use a long transparent ruler. A long transparent ruler so that you can see the points falling to the left and the points falling to the right. If you use the opaque ruler like the, the metallic ruler or the wooden ruler, you would only see the points on one side. You won't see the points falling out on the other side. Hence, you end up drawing the, drawing the line of best fit before you see that, oh, this is not good enough. Then you start erasing and you make your graph look bad. Your graph will not look good. So, that's that about drawing your line of best fit. Also, your graph must be big enough. Let's assume this is the graph paper. Your graph must be as big as this. If this is your graph paper, and you plot your graph like this, this is very bad. If this is your graph paper, your graph must cover most part of your graph paper, graph paper, at least two thirds of your graph paper, your graph would look like this. And then you draw a line of best fits. Okay? This is your y axis, this is your x axis. Okay? This is a good way of drawing it. Your graph, this is your graph paper. Draw your graph like this. arrange your points such that your graph will cover 
a large portion of your graph paper. You don't plot your graph at a small corner of your graph paper. It will, have, it will affect the accuracy of your work. You don't do this. This is very bad. Your work will not be accurate. Your stuff will not be accurate. Your intercept will not be accurate. You end up losing math for your accuracy. So that's it about your graph. Your graph must be big. Also, your points must be accurately plotted. So let me let me just draw a line of best fit for this. How many points do I have on the right? One, two. On the left, one, two. One point is falling. Now let's assume this is my graph. How would I do my slope? Now to do your slope, to get your slope, you have to use a straight ruler to draw a right angle triangle. I can't do this without a ruler. Let me get something I can use to hold. This is our long ruler. Now you have to draw a big right angle triangle on this your line of the street. If I draw a right angle triangle as small as this, I would lose marks for my slope. You must draw a big right angle triangle so that you can trace your point. So you calculate your slope from the values you get when you draw a big right angle triangle. This is what I mean. I also draw a very big right angle triangle. If I draw it like this, that will be correct, okay? You might decide to stop here. To get your point, you write your slope S is equal to, you know, you've plotted values of R, so you have R2 minus R1 divided by your horizontal axis, you have V raised power minus 1. So you have V raised power minus 1 subscript 2 minus V raised power minus 1 subscript 1. What that means is the value of the value on the view is power minus one axis. The value you have here, you use dotted line to trace it. Your value here, this is your V2. You trace this down. Your value here, this is your V1. This is your V2. Now on the R axis, your value here is your R1. Your value here. Oh, sorry, this should be long enough. Now your value here is your R2. So when you calculate your slope, the value you have here, okay, you know your graph paper will be calibrated. The value you have here, your R2, minus the value you have here, divided by the value here, V2 inverse, minus the value here. V inverse, V1 inverse, V2 inverse minus V1 inverse. This are this how you write your slope. S is equal to this. Okay, whatever you have plotted, that is what you write for your slope. You don't write um, slope equals to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 because the question did not ask you. Your procedure did not ask you to to plot a graph of x. Of the, the opposite, you know, ask you to plot a graph of y against x. The opposite asks you to plot a graph of r against v raised power minus 1. So when you are writing your slope, you must write r against your v raised power of minus 1. So you just lift your values from your graph, you lift your v2 inverse, v1 inverse, your r2, your r1, you subtract this, subtract this, you divide. Okay, I'm not putting any value here because I've not plotted the graph. Okay, so that's how you get your slope. Now your intercept is the question request for intercepts on the vertical axis. Whatever value you have here, you just write it down. 
and the question requests for that for the intercept on the horizontal axis this is horizontal axis whatever value you have here where the slope cuts that axis this is where the slope cuts the horizontal axis so whatever value you have here that's what you write down and the question has requested for your intercept on the vertical axis or intercept on the arrow axis your arrow axis is your vertical axis so it's request for intercepts on the arrow axis this is what you pick as your intercept after we see it won't be as it's not a question for you so it will be in the marking guard okay so when they compare your value with what they have so you you will be awarded based on their marking guard now when it comes to precaution this is where many students make mistakes Let us assume you were asked to state Newton's second law of motion and you proceeded to say Newton's second law of motion states that the rate of change of momentum is directly proportional to the force acting on a body and takes place in the direction of the force. This is definition in many people's memory. Many people have memorized this definition but it's actually very wrong because it does not capture the formula that this definition brings to mind. Newton's second law of motion states that the time rate of change of linear momentum is directly proportional to the resultant force acting on your body and it takes place in the direction of the force. Why is, it, why is this the correct one? Now, look at this. The time rate of change of linear momentum. That means change in momentum with time is directly proportional to the resultant force. Is directly proportional to the force. Why is this the correct one? Because you know momentum is mass multiplied by velocity. Okay, so mass multiplied by velocity. Change in mass multiplied by velocity divided by time, multiply proportional to force, and it's true. Because m v over t, v over t is acceleration. So this is m a. Mass and acceleration is equal to force. But if you want to use this, this is a couple of motion states that the rate of change of momentum, change in momentum, is directly proportional to the force, proportional to the force, and takes place in the direction of the force. Let's leave the direction. So momentum is m v. How is change in m v proportional to force? From this definition, we cannot get the formula, okay? It looks correct, but this is actually a wrong way of stating the formula. Because we are here now, it's, okay, it's not even stated that linear momentum. It's just the rate of change of momentum. What if you are talking about the angular momentum? So uh, the way of stating the law must capture the key points, the key words in that law. So here, we have the sign the time rate of change of linear momentum of a body, linear momentum, is directly proportional to the resultant force. Resultant force, not just the force, because you might have two or more forces acting on a body. So it takes place in the direction of that resultant force. It takes place in the direction of the force. Experiments would verify this to be correct. So when you are stating your law, you must also state, you must always state the correct law. You know, when you state a law, you don't have to give additional information about it because it is a law that has been propounded by somebody, okay? It is when you are defining, for example, you, if you are to define velocity, okay, you have to give additional information to get the full mark. You could say it's a vector quantity or you say it's SI unit is meter per second. When you are testing a law, you don't have to give additional information. The law is enough to give you the full marks for the question. So, that is that. Let's go straight to the second part, which is usually a calculation. Let us assume that the question asks you to calculate the weight of a book whose mass is 2 kg, given that the acceleration due to gravity g is 10 meters per second squared. Are you proceeding to write just weight is equal to 2 multiplied by 10, which is equal to 20? That would be very, very wrong. There are steps to solving questions in physics. 
And the first thing you write is your formula. You write weight is equal to mg. Then you write weight is equal to what's your mass? 2 kilograms. 2 multiplied by your gravity. Gravity is 10. So you write your weight is equal to 2 times 10, 20. Then you must get your SI unit, Newton. So all your steps, marks are allocated to your steps, okay? This could be one mark. So that's it. You must state your formula, then your step, your calculation, then your unit. Your unit knows that the way it was solved the previous time, the, previous, the way it was solved previously, the SI unit was not stated, the formula was not stated. So that person would have just gotten half mark for a step. But you, when you are solving, when you state your formula, you solve your steps, your answer, and the SI unit, you get your full two marks for that calculation. So that is what distinguishes someone who is aiming at scoring an A from someone who is aiming at scoring a B or a C. Always aim at an A. Always aim for the best. So the pattern we have just discussed for your Y practical, the same goes with your NERCO and your GC. The only difference is when you are stating your precaution in your GC. You don't say I avoided zero error. You say I would avoid zero error. I would avoid parallax error because you are not, you would not actually perform the practical. You'll be giving the values. You just assume, you just assume a situation whereby you imagine a situation whereby you would perform the experiment. What would you do? Which precautions would you take while performing the experiment? So you say, I would avoid parallax error. That's your precaution. That's when you are taking your GC. But for your Kaneko, your precaution would be past tense. So that's that about how to make an A in your examination. Thank you for watching. Have a nice time.
So we have discussed how to make how to make good grades in your practical. Trust me, if you follow all the steps I've stated, you wouldn't score less than 48 out of 50. And if you are missing two marks, it could even it could be due to accuracy while performing your experiment. Always remember your observation. Try as much as possible to write all your values to three decimal places if you get confused. But if you are not confused, make sure you write everything to the appropriate number of significant places. If on your table there's a particular number that involves logarithm, write it to at least three significant figures, not less than three significant figures. That you are taking logarithm. For example, your table, you have um, R, then log R. R in home, then log R, log R, R. When you take logarithm, you don't have, you don't need SI units. So let's assume your R, you have um, 100, okay, 100.0. If you are taking the logarithm, it must be 2.000, okay? It must be to at least three significant figures, okay? So let's assume the second one is um, 80.0. If you are writing it, you must write it as um, 1.x. X, X. Three significant figures, okay? So when you take log 80, whatever value you have, okay? So that's how you write when you're having logarithm. That's for your observation, okay? So in case you have any problem with the number of decimal places, okay, or number of significant figures, write everything to three. Your graph, make sure you have a big graph, your slope, you draw a big triangle while drawing your slope. Intercept, you pick from the um you 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 select the value where your line of best fit hit any of the axes whether horizontal or vertical whichever one the question requests for evaluation you evaluate appropriately accuracy that is not for you okay but many students might lose marks for accuracy let's leave that precaution you state your precaution appropriately your spelling must be correct your question b1 and b2 b1 is usually your precaution, you must use the appropriate words, appropriate tenses, and appropriate spelling. Your B1 and B2, B1, when it comes to the... B1, when it comes to the definition, you must give the definition, appropriate definition, and additional information. And if you have to state a law, you must state the law appropriately. And your B2 calculation, you must state your formula, you don't jump steps, and your answer comes with the SI unit. That's for your practical, okay? You make good grades in your practical. Your objective question, you have to keep practicing the work past questions, okay? And you have to keep reading textbooks. If possible, you go online. You might even watch YouTube tutorials. The same goes with your theory. You have to study very hard. Study very well and practice. Always practice your past question and always read your textbook. You can do well to subscribe to our YouTube channel because very soon, Subscribe to our YouTube channel because there will be we'll be dealing with square fast questions and answers. So you can always watch our YouTube channel. Subscribe. Search for Physics for Everybody on YouTube and hit the subscribe button. So I can always get our videos immediately we, are, we release them, provided you are online. Thank you for watching. Have a nice time.